Rumor of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior Holiness with human hands Treasure for the traitor No ear has heard, no eyes have seen The image of the Father Till heaven came to live with me A rescue like no other Yes, you are worthy You are worthy of your name Yes, you are worthy You are worthy of your name Jesus you did not speak, you made no sound You died for your accusers But as the blood fell to the ground You redefined my future Yet on that day that you arose The darkness ran for cover King of kings has claimed his throne Now and to forever Yeah, you are worthy Yeah You are worthy of your name Yes, you are worthy You alone You are worthy of your name Jesus My Savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battles, my anchor for all my days. And you stood by my side and you stood in my place. Jesus, no other name. Sing it out, come on. Only Jesus, no other name. Yes, you are worthy. Yeah. You are worthy of your name. Yes, you are worthy. You alone. You are worthy of your name. Jesus. Hey, City Kids, welcome to our Kids Connection. We've been learning new memory verses this month, and I thought it'd be fun to review them together right here this morning. So stand on up and get ready, and parents, you can join in the fun too. Our preschool memory verse comes from John 20, 31, and goes like this. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. John 20, 31. Our elementary verse comes from Ephesians 2.8 and goes like this, God's grace has saved you because of your faith in Christ. Your salvation does not come from anything you do. It is God's gift, Ephesians 2.8. Our Bible stories for today can be found on the ParentQ app or by going to the Parent Q website. We've been learning all about Jesus and how we can believe in him. Today, our preschoolers will hear a story from the book of Acts about a man named Paul who traveled to Rome and told other people about Jesus. He went to many places to tell people that they can believe in Jesus, and we're reminded in our story today that we can believe in him too. 
Our elementary kids have been focusing on knowing and believing in Jesus too. Today, you'll hear a story from the book of Acts about Paul and the faith that he had in God. When we're sad or hurt or our problems seem really big, we can talk to God about them. And we're reminded from our story today that we too can have faith in God and that he will answer our prayers and that he is always with us. Thanks for tuning in. We miss all of you and we are praying for you. Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Online Church. Uh, this has become the normal for most churches as we're navigating through this season together. Um, continue to just challenge you to stay connected the best we can. Uh, we are offering some online small groups on Wednesday nights, and we'd love to see you uh, get involved in, in one of those. Um, another thing that's, that's really a helpful resource during the preaching time is our website, citiesoulministries.org. Uh, you can just click on the bulletin link. And it will bring up just a section for you to be able to take notes uh, through this sermon today and, and each week. So we're blessed to be able to offer that to you as well and encourage you to take the time to take notes because we got a lot to talk about today. So open your Bible with me to John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42. So we have just wrapped up in our study in the Gospel of John, where Jesus has been painting this picture of the relationship of a shepherd and his sheep. Now, the simple conclusion, I don't have time to preach the message again, but the simple conclusion that I can give you that we come to from this is that Jesus is teaching that he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd protects his sheep. He lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus also claims that he is the door, that he is the only way back to the Father. And we have some amazing truths that we talked about last week, and I would encourage you to listen to that message if you didn't get to. Let me get you thinking in the direction of this message today by just asking you a few questions. You ever heard the line before that talk is cheap? Or maybe you've heard someone say it this way, your mouth is writing checks that your actions cannot cash. Or maybe even just to simplify it even more, you better be able to back up what you say. Sure you have. You've heard people say that those, those lines before. And the truth is, is anyone can talk Anyone can run their mouth and make claims. Anyone can, can tell you anything, but the proof is in their actions. The proof is them actually putting it into play. The proof is when you can back it up with your actions, um, your words that you're saying. You know, I, I could stand here today and I could look into this camera and I could say, you know, I want to I proclaim today, I want to say today that I am the best athlete to ever walk the face of this earth. And many of you are laughing right now, and some of you would say, well, we'll prove it. Prove that you're the best athlete to ever walk the face of this earth. Now, I will say that I love sports, and I'm a, I'm a decent athlete, but my actions could never back up that statement that I'm the greatest athlete that ever walked the face of this earth. The reason I, I get you thinking in this direction is Jesus has been making and saying some very big statements, huge statements about who he is. He's making the biggest claims that any person could ever make. He's claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God, that he is the only way back to the Father. So we continue today with these big claims that Jesus makes about who he is and who his true sheep truly are. Let's jump in today to verses 22 through 23. We'll start out and tackle those together. It says, At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the, so in the colonnade of Solomon. So we'll stop there and just want to give you a little history here for my history buffs. Um, we have another feast that we read about here in the Gospel of John. However, this feast of dedication is not mentioned in the Old Testament. The reason being is it happened between the Old Testament and New Testament times, the intertestament period. Well, this this uh, festival celebrates the Israelite victory over the Syrian leader, Anicus Epiphanes. This was a, a really bad guy. And that's really all you need to know. He persecuted Israel heavily. He killed lots of people, slaughtered many Jews. He not only killed many people, he took over the temple desecrated the temple, set up pagan shrines, did, did all kinds of just horrible things. And there's, there's a lot more to this guy's story. And if you want to research him this week, you can read a little bit more. But 
really what you need to know, he was a bad dude, not a good guy. So the Jews rallied together and fought back with what we would understand are called guerrilla warfare. And they win and defeat and, and take back the temple. They were led by a guy named Judas Maccabeus. Now they have this feast that we're reading about here, this feast of dedication to celebrate this victory of regaining the temple from Anicus. Now this feast is also known as the Feast of Lights, where they would light candles and lamps to remember and commemorate that victory. We would recognize it as Hanukkah. You know, the Jews today celebrate Hanukkah. You've probably heard of that. And it happens during the winter time. So just a little bit of history there for you, a little bit of interesting things to read about and to study. And it's incredible when you study God's Word to, to look at these things and would encourage you this week to read a little bit more about that if you choose to do so. So let's move on to verse 24. So the Jews gather around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So the Pharisees are wanting a, a clear answer. And maybe at face value, you're like, well, maybe they just want to believe. You know, maybe they're, they're ready to profess their faith in Christ as the Messiah. No, there's a deeper reason why they're saying this. They had no intention of believing in Christ as the long-awaited Messiah. Because many of the Jews and many of the religious leaders had this idea in their minds of what they wanted their Messiah to be like. They wanted a, a strong military leader as their Messiah. And Jesus wasn't that, and Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted him to be. They wanted him to clearly say that he was the Messiah so they could kill him. Well, Jesus responds in verses 25 through 30 this way. He says, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And then this huge claim again, I and the Father are one. Again, huge statements, so much rich theological truth that Jesus is teaching here. Jesus has been crystal clear in his words. Remember back in our study in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am insinuating and telling that he's always existed, that he is the eternal son, that he is the only begotten son, that he has always existed, that he and the Father are one. Then he's like, well, take a look at the works that I do. The proof is also there. The miracles, the unexplainable works that Jesus has done prove and validate that he is the Messiah. He was born in the line of David, just like the prophecies had said. He was introduced by John the Baptist, no one had ever spoke like he had. No one had ever taught like he had. No one had ever done the miracles, the incredible miracles that he had done. His teachings proved that he was the Messiah. His life proved that he was the Messiah. And his miracles proved and validated his Messiahship. So the, the question then naturally becomes, how in the world could these guys, these religious leaders, not see the clear proof right in front of their eyes? How could they possibly miss Jesus? How could they not see Jesus as the Messiah? See, the problem here is not uh, the lack of, of proof in, in, in the situation or the credentials that Jesus brings to the table. The problem is unbelief. The problem is very simple, that these religious leaders were not his sheep. And they just prove that fact by their blatant unbelief right in the face, face to face with Jesus the Messiah. They have not been given to the Son by the Father. They are not his sheep. One of the biggest things that I hear from Christians about their faith is oftentimes they feel very unsure about the security of their salvation. They may say something like, or you may have said something like this before, and I I really messed up this time and I, and I just don't feel saved. I don't, I don't feel like a Christian anymore. 
In other words, assurance of salvation in many people's eyes hinges upon what we wrongly think is us. That if we possibly mess up too badly, that if we miss too many Sundays of church, that if we don't read our Bibles enough, that if we have a bad day, that if a sin creeps back into our lives, that somehow, some way, in those circumstances, in those instances, that now our salvation is possibly in jeopardy. Some even wrongly, and I say wrongly, think that their salvation can be lost. Don't listen to my words. My words mean nothing. Don't take my word for it. Listen carefully to the words of Jesus again, my Messiah and many of your Messiah uh, today. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. In other words, if, if I say, or I, I believe that I could lose my salvation, that somehow, some way my salvation can be snatched or taken from me, then I'm in essence saying really, that Jesus and God the Father can't do what they said they would do. No one can snatch us from his hand. I just want to stop for a second, and I just want you to rest in this truth today. Rest in the truth of what Jesus is saying here. Rest in the security of your salvation. And thankfully, and I want to emphasize that, I can't emphasize it enough, thankfully, our salvation never did, never has, and never will hinge upon us. It is all upon the finished work of Christ and what he's done for us. I love how John MacArthur says it about if a person could lose their salvation. He says this, he says, if you could lose your salvation, you would. That is such a a true statement because if my salvation did hinge upon me, I would have lost my salvation a long time ago. I've messed up many times. I've doubted at times. But I'm so thankful today that my assurance of salvation doesn't hinge upon my works, doesn't hinge upon me, but upon the work that was done in my life by my Father in heaven. We are secure because Jesus is the good shepherd. He alone has the power to keep us safe. This is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. We talked about this in John chapter 6. And it's a beautiful, rich theological truth that we see here in the Gospel of John. Jesus had just finished saying that the good shepherd keeps his sheep safe from thieves and robbers and the wolf. God is in control over all things. God is sovereign. And he says that no one can take nor harm his sheep. The future of God's sheep the future of those who have been saved by the Father is secure. It's guaranteed by Jesus and the Father. Maybe that's a passage that you need to underline, highlight, um, write, and, and put it on your refrigerator and just rest in that, be reminded of that every day, even when you don't feel like you're being a very good Christian. Let's move on to verses 31 and 33. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. So another attempt is made by the religious leaders to kill Jesus. And here's the bottom line. The religious leaders know exactly what Jesus is saying. It was loud and it was clear. Jesus was making himself equal with God. They accused him of blasphemy because he called himself God. And it's very ironic that they want to kill him because he claims to be God while they miss the fact that he is God. Jesus' response is given to us in the next few verses here, verses 34 through 38. He says, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, I love that part, and scripture cannot be broken, 
Do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So, and I bet at face value, um, that's super confusing. <laughs> You're like, what in the world is going on here? I want to tell you that uh, these few verses here have been pulled out and used by, by false teachers in such a, a big and, and damaging way. Remember, I, I tell you all the time that context is of the utmost importance when we're reading and studying Scripture. So what exactly is Jesus saying here, talking about gods and call, what, what in the world is happening here? Well, let me start off by explaining to you what Jesus is not saying, what Jesus is not saying. There is a, a false teaching in our culture today that's being pumped into our American Christian culture, and I say that loosely, and it's the idea that Christians are little, lowercase gods. Let me explain kind of how this is happening. The idea of little gods, this false doctrine, is coming from what is called the, the foundation of what we see the, the, the prosperity movement, the prosperity gospel, false gospel in our culture today. And the premise behind this false prosperity gospel is that since we are Christians, that it's always God's will that we are to never be sick, that we are to flourish greatly, to have success and money and, and all of these things. Well, the idea behind this prosperity theology is that if you do get sick, or you aren't prospering and your life is you know, not as happy as it should be, that it can be traced back to the fact that your faith isn't strong enough. That if you can now muster up enough faith and build this faith up and strengthen your faith and name and claim your health or your wealth, then it can happen for you or it will happen for you. Well, this will be taken out of context here and say that we are God's by this movement, by this prosperity, by all of this stuff. Now, I don't feel like I need to spend any time today talking to those of you listening to this message and telling you, hey, you're not a God. <laughs> I'm not a God. You know, we're not gods. But a lot of what's being pumped into quote-unquote Christian teaching from TV today, uh, some of the books that we read off this prosperity principle, uh, Little God's Principle, let me just sum it up to you very simply. Be careful. Be careful what you're listening to. Be careful what you're reading. The wolf doesn't show up with his fangs shown. He shows up in the shadows. Test everything that you hear up against Scripture. You know, this prosperity gospel, and it, it appeals to the human nature. It appeals to your desires and to mine. To say that, you know, God wants you to always be healthy and to live your best life now and to, to have money and fame and success and that you have the power. You're, you're a little God. Man, it's, it's, it's scary and it's so warped and it's so wrong. Test what a pastor says up against Scripture. Test what I say up against Scripture. I would encourage you a little homework assignment for this week to research the prosperity movement a little bit more. I think you'll be shocked uh, surprised about some of these things that maybe you've never even thought about and some of the things that maybe you've read or heard from certain pastors or read in a book, be very careful. Look it up this week, um, be educated, and run as far away as you can from these false teachings. So we all know that there's only one true God. There are not multiple gods. And of course, if we claim to be a lowercase god, that, of course, is so far off track and so wrong. So we've briefly addressed, and I could talk about that for a long time, but I'm not, about what this text doesn't mean, that we aren't little gods. So the question is now, what does it mean? What in the world is going on here? Well, what Jesus is quoting here is directly from Psalms 82, verses 6 and 7. The, the false teachers don't like to read verse 7, but I'm going to read verse 6 and 7. It says, I say you are gods. You are all children of the Most High. And then verse 7, but you will die like mere mortals and fall like every other ruler. 
So the Hebrew word here used in Jesus, used by Jesus and in, in, in Psalms is talking about human rulers. Kings and judges in the Old Testament times were put in place to enforce and to communicate the decree and the plan of God. God has placed these rulers, these human leaders, for the stability of society. These earthly people were applying the judgment of God's law. God refers to them as little gods because they were executing God's word. They were the messenger. They were carrying out God's judgment. These rulers were ordained by God. They got their power from God. They act for God, and they stand between God uh, between God and their people. This is why they are referred to as lowercase gods. This is what Jesus is saying and making the point that no one then picked up stones to kill them for blasphemy when they were called lowercase gods. So what we see here is a play on words. Jesus is saying if these judges were referred to as little gods, that certainly the Messiah can be called God with a capital G because he's the son of the most high. This is what theologians call the lesser to the greater argument. That if it was okay in the Old Testament days uh, for these mere men to be called lowercase gods, Jesus is saying how much more legitimate is it that God incarnate, God in the flesh, be called God. God gave Jesus this mission. He sent Jesus. And the question is, is, well, then who are the real blasphemers? Of course, the religious leaders were. It wasn't Jesus. They were accusing the Son of God of blasphemy and were in the ultimate wrong themselves. So to kind of sum that up, God in Scripture can be referring to, of course, the one true God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct uh, persons of, of the Trinity. God in Scripture can be referring to false gods, false idols, lowercase gods, or it can refer to human rulers in the context here. Again, context is of the utmost importance. Another huge reason why we preach through books of the Bible so that this is presented in the correct context. Jesus has also made it crystal clear, and I pointed it out to you, the scripture cannot be broken. The scripture is absolutely perfect, accurate, and authoritative. Let's close today with verses 39 through 42. It says, again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John the Baptist, uh, where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that Jesus said about this but everything that John, excuse me, said about this man was true. Verse 42, and many believed in him there. Again, we see that it's not Jesus' time to lay down his life yet. See, John the Baptist didn't do any of the miracles that Jesus had done. John the Baptist was the voice from the wilderness who just bore witness to the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. Let me close today with this quote from J. Vernon McGee about the shepherd and his relationship with his sheep. And this is just an invitation for you this morning. If the Lord is drawing you, tugging on your heart to respond to him in faith, to put your faith in him. And the question is, is what do you think of Christ? This is the way to test your position. You can't be right in any of the rest unless you are first right and you're thinking about him. What do you think of Christ? If you are his sheep, you will hear his voice. If you are not, you will not hear him. His voice will be drowned out in the babble of voices speaking to you. His sheep are able to hear the Son of God. I don't know who needed to hear this message today. So much truth, so much uh, rich theological things that we've unpacked together. And, and I hope that it's stirred in you a more passion for uh, loving God's word and, and seeking his face more and more every single day. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, today we just stand in awe of your presence. Although we're not able to gather physically um, at City Soul, we're thankful that we have this ability to gather online. 
Father, as your word is preached, I, I pray for clarity uh, from, from my part, from, from your Holy Spirit working through me to articulate these truths to your people. And Father, I pray for hearts that are being softened by you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to gather this morning, and I, and I pray that, that, Father, your people would just continue to love you more, seek you more, love you with every aspect of who they are, and to seek your face every single day. Father, we give you the glory for this word today, for your word. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.